Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the World Forestry Week side event, Planting Forests for Carbon Neutral Economies, Sustainable Landscapes and Livelihoods. I am Thais Linhares Juvenal, team leader of the Sustainable Forestry Value Chains, Innovation and Investments stream within FAO's Forestry Division. And I am also the Secretary of the International Commission on Poplars and other fast-growing trees sustaining people and the environment. I will be moderating this event today. It's a great honor to have such honorable and knowledgeable speakers here with us. Planted forests are forests predominantly established by planting seedlings or seeds. They produce a wide variety of products and services, including wood, and on wood products, forest protection and restoration, biodiversity, or carbon sequestration. They have the potential to provide a balanced package of important social and environmental benefits. Today, in our side event, we are going to discuss how we can advance the contributions of planted forests to Agenda 2030. Our main objectives are to enhance knowledge on planted forests to enable global restoration action to meet both environmental and socioeconomic needs. We also want to raise awareness on the new mandate of the International Commission on Poplars and Other Fresh Growing Trees Sustaining People and the Environment, which since, uh, very recently had a new strategy approved. And we also want to highlight the importance of science and the role of networks to enable the expansion of planted forests and discussing the private sector opportunity and responsibility. To address these points, after the opening remarks of Mr. Ewald Hamsteiner, who is here with us on stage, Deputy Director with FAO's Forestry Division, we will hear from Mr. Ansi Pekarinen, team leader of Forest Resource Assessment, also in the FAO's uh, Forestry Division. Ansi will tell us some key facts and figures about the extent of planted forests and other wooded land. Subsequently, we will discuss with our distinguished panelists aspects related to the science, policy, and practice on planted forests. So, before we start our discussions, I would like to ask Mr. Ewald Hamsteiner for his opening remarks. Evo, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Thais. That's for you. Good morning, colleagues. Good afternoon, good evening for those that are following online, distinguished guests. It is my great pleasure to open today this World Forest Week side event on planted forests for carbon neutral economies, sustainable landscapes and livelihoods. With a world population projected to grow to almost 10 billion people in 2050, the needs for food, feed, fuel, fiber, fodder and other bio-based products, including very innovative products will raise, rise sharply. The consumption of uh, primary processed wood products is therefore ex expected to increase by some 37% by 2050. That's not quite, but almost double the amount that of consumption as we have today. Planted forests come in for that reason. Currently, they, they cover around 290 million hectares, and we will hear a little bit more about this in a minute, uh, which is a very small percentage of the global uh, world's forest area, a mere 7%. The surface is expanding, but not as fast as it did a decade or more ago. And we have monospecies planted forests under intensive management, that we, which we call plantations. They are 
a fraction of planted forests. They cover around 33%, sorry, 3% of the global forest area, around 131 million hectares. But they produce a lot of the primary material coming from forests in terms of wood, almost a third or around a third of total roundwood production in 2012. Now, with the increasing demand for wood, with the climate issues, with a lot of other issues that we have, including recovery needs, energy needs, etc., there is an increasing recognition of the role of planted forests to meet these growing demands, but also as a means to reverse forest degradation and to stop or halt deforestation reducing pressure on natural forests. It is, in many ways, if properly done, a nature-based solution, and it is a, an important part of the solution that we are aiming for, namely carbon-neutral economies, with restored landscapes, productive landscapes, ecologically functioning landscapes, and livelihoods that we can provide from those landscapes. So planted forests, now and in the future must not only produce more raw material, they also need to be socially acceptable and they need to be more diverse in order to be resilient, resilient for the climate change that is affecting all of us, including ecosystems. So I hope you are largely familiar with FAO's work on planted forests. FAO has had quite some work in the past. We have continued working on this. Uh, we have focused in the past more on promoting and enabling the responsible management of planted forests and, and produced a number of important publications that still have high value. But we also see, and we have seen this change in FAO from a more plantation-oriented or planted forest-oriented productivity focus to this broader focus on socially responsible, environmentally responsible work around planted forests and plantations. Given this shift that we all have seen overall on the planet on those topics, uh, we do think that there is a new chapter to be opened with planted forests as uh, an important part of the solutions in the transformation to more efficient, inclusive, resilient, and sustainable agri-food systems that we need to meet the Agenda 2030. FAO is focusing on four betters in this transition, really targeting the SDGs. That is better production, better nutrition, better environment, and better life. We are quite convinced that in all of these three, planted forests have a major role to play and today's side event will be an opportunity to look into these different aspects because they need to be integrated to become a holistic whole. Better production, better nutrition, better environment, and a better life. So we have a range of perspectives today here on the role of planted forests on these to discuss challenges, opportunities, and best practices to enable the expansion of planted forests as an essential nature-based solution, to accelerate the transition to, towards a carbon-neutral economy, sustainable livelihoods and, uh, sorry, sustainable livelihoods, that's true, uh, sustainable landscapes as well, and basically resilient environments and resilient economies and societies. All of this we will need as we walk into the future. We thank you very much for your interest and participation, and I wish you and us all together an insightful event today. Thank you very much. With this, I give back the floor to you, moderator. Thank you very much, Evo. Thank you. Thank you very much, Evo. And you highlighted many important aspects of the FAO's agenda and the challenge that we have to expand the total area of granted forests. At the moment, we have only 7% of, uh, um, of the global forest area as planted forests in their different categories. 
And to talk uh, to us about these categories, we will have Mr. Ansi Pekarinen, team leader, Global Forest Resource Assessment in the Forestry Division, to help us better understand what are planted forests, uh, what are the internationally agreed definitions on planted forests, and he will share with us what the 2020 Global Forest Resource Assessment can teach us with regards to the global area under planted forests, their distributions, and their main trends. Ansi Pekarinen, please, <laughs> you have the floor. Thank you, Thais. Uh, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, good morning, everyone. Great to see you here, and I'm, I'm honored to be here with you today. As you heard, my, my talk today will focus on the extent of land, planted forest and other land with tree cover, because there are trees also outside of forest. But let me start with a brief reminder what the FRA Global Forest Resources Assessment actually is. Global Forest Resources Assessment is something that FAO conducts uh, using a five-year cycle at the request of FAO members. It is the most comprehensive assessment of global forest resources, and it covers roughly 60 broad variable categories. It is also the most authoritative assessment of global forest resources because it is based on official country statistics that we are collecting through officially nominated network of national correspondents that covers 187 countries and territories as of today. Um, the outreach products, the different reports that result from this huge effort of data collection and analysis, have reached more than 140,000 users in the latest assessment FRA 2020, as we call it. Now, when talking about anything, basically, it is important to have common definitions about things. When we are talking about forests in the context of global forest resources assessment, we are talking about land spanning more than half a hectare with trees that can reach five meter at least and with a canopy cover of more than 10%. And the important thing is that the forest definition is a land use definition. Forests do not include land that are predominantly under other land uses such as agriculture and urban land. Within the forests, we divide the forest into naturally regenerating forests and planted forests. And as we heard already, the planted forests are forests predominantly composed of trees established through planting or seeding. And then since the latest assessment, FRA 2020, we are also dividing planted forests into two different categories. Plantation forests that are intensively managed and meet all uh, a number of different uh, criteria, and the pla other planted forests, which are planted forests that resemble more natural forests in their uh, maturity. Now, we have already heard this figure, I think, two times, but let's <laughs> repeat it once again. The, only 7% of the world's forests are planted, and that is roughly the already heard 300 million hectares. Of these 7%, 3% are plantation forests, that are those intensively managed uh, planted forests. The global forest area uh, in the latest assessment was 4 billion hectares, 4.06 billion hectares, which is roughly 31% of the total land area of the globe. When looking at the trend in the planted forest area, we can see that the area of planted forest has increased more than 70% since the 1990s, when it was 170 million hectares, and now we have reached 293 million hectares. But, of course, the planted forests are not equally distributed in different region, regions. In a, uh, the most of the planted forests, in terms, terms of area, are found in Asia, followed by New, uh, Europe and North and Central America. And when looking at the percentage of the 
of the forests that are planted in these regions, we can see a similar trend. Most of the planted forest, uh, the share of the planted forest is highest in Asia, reaching about 20%, followed by Europe again and North America. But then, there, as already mentioned, there are trees also outside of forests on the, what we call other land with tree cover. These are, these are areas where the trees meet the biophysical definition of forests, but not the land use definition. So these are lands that are predominantly of other land use than forest, agriculture or urban, for example. And <laughs> the global, here we can see the global area of the other land with tree cover, which is reaching uh, in the agroforestry category around 45 million hectares. Um, but the problem with that category is that the reporting is not complete. Uh, for all of those categories we just saw, the reporting is being done by less than 100 countries and territories globally, whereas the total number of countries and territories is 236. Because of that, partially, and also to produce some other additional information, FAO has conducted a global remote sensing survey uh, during the last years. This was done in very close collaboration with the national experts, and it involved training of more than 800 experts from 126 countries and territories. And according to this assessment, the other land with tree cover can actually be much larger than what was thought on the basis of the FRA reporting. This is something that we need to look into very carefully in the coming years. And uh, in fact, it seems that we will be requested to conduct a global survey on, on agroforestry that will produce more information about this variable. But the difference between the two assessment is quite significant, as you can see from here. Only in Africa, we are talking about 100 million hectares of trees uh, in, sorry, 400 million hectares of trees outside of, uh, on other land. So, the key messages are about 7% of the global forests, forest area is planted. The area of for, forest, uh, planted forest has increased by 72% since 1990. And it has been partially compensating the loss of natural forest in terms of global forest area chains. Asia has the largest area of planted forest, 135 million hectares, and the largest share of planted forest of total forest area. And finally, as just said, information on other land with tree cover is much more uncertain because of the small number of countries that are reporting on this variable, and the results from the RAR remote, remote sensing survey suggest that the area can be actually much larger than what we have uh, analyzed on the basis of the country reporting. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for your attention. And back to, back to Thais. Thank you very much, Ansi. This was very informative, I think, and very important for the discussions we're going to have today. I don't know about you, but I have FRA as my Bible, and I have a lot of fun going through the FRA platform, so I recommend you do it. So, we learned from Ansi the main trends on planted forests, uh, what is happening with three outside forests, how the uh, uh, FRA remote survey, remote sensing survey, uh, is giving us more uh, details on where we should explore uh, and, and understand more what's happening uh, in the field, not only with the planted forests, but also with trees outside forests. So I would like to close this part of our side event. Thank you, Evold. Ansi has already left, he's quick. <laughs> and I'd like to invite you to, thank you, Evold to have, uh, uh, we're going to have a video now um, that will tell us a little bit more about the challenge we are facing. The video, please.
A growing population means more buildings to fit everyone. By 2030, we will have to house an additional 3 billion people. The problem is that a lot of the building materials we use just aren't good enough for the planet. This is where wood from sustainably managed forests comes in. Thanks to innovation, wood is a modern, strong, renewable alternative. With wood, we can build faster, tread lighter, and create homes that don't cost us the earth. Choose sustainable wood for people and the planet. So I hope you have enjoyed the video. Um, I'm not sure if you followed the FAO um, uh, media communication efforts during the International Day of Forests. Uh, this year, the International Day of Forests was on the SDG 12, Responsible Consumption and Production. And uh, we, we released a series of videos and uh, other media products emphasizing the role uh, of wood um, to, for us to achieve uh, carbon neutral economies. So this was one of our videos on choosing sustainable wood for the planet. Uh, I would like now to invite uh, our colleagues who are going to uh, participate of our panel. I think everyone is ready, so I would like to invite uh, Ross Hampton, Chief Executive Officer, Australian Forest Products Association, Australia and Chairperson of the Advisory Committee on Forest-Based Industries. Welcome, to Ross. Good morning. Um, Mr. Tom Okello Obong, Executive Director of the Uganda National Forest Authority. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, Mr. Christophe Horatio, Director, European Institute of Planted Forest and lead of the EUFRO Task Force Resilient Planted Forest Serving Society and Bioeconomy. Good morning, Christophe. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Luis Neves Silva from the New Generation is the leader of the New Generation Plantations of the WWF International. Good morning. Mr. Martin Vey, the chairperson of the International of the IPC, the International. Um, pop, the International Commission on Poplars and Other Fast Growing Trees, Sustaining People and Environment. And Mr. Julian Noel Raco Tradisoa, Forest and Landscape Restoration and African Restoration Initiative, AFR 100 Focal Point, Ministry of Environment and Sustainable Development in Madagascar. Our speakers today will tell us more about how they see the trends, what is the science guiding planted forests, and how we can tackle our environmental and socioeconomic objectives through planted forests. Let me first welcome Mr. Christophe Ohatsio. I would like to ask Christophe what can science bring to address the growing needs for wood and non-wood forest products? Can you tell us more about the recent scientific developments and avenues that, in your opinion, need consideration? How to facilitate the uptake of promising practice? Christophe, please. <laughs> Thank you for giving me the floor. Um, so we'll try to answer the three questions. The first one is about um, what science brings to address the increasing demand. We had uh, recently a workshop uh, last week on Thursday and Friday um, on mixed plantation. Mixed plantation are interesting because we can have some kind of over yielding, mixing two species and also increase resilience. But this is quite challenging. There is a lot of research needed still on that. 
Um, science also provides more accurate monitoring information. We have uh, remote sensing, IoTs, artificial intelligences, many tools that help us to know and better qualify the resource we have, where it is, what we can use for industry. Um, we have also improved material. There is a lot of progress done uh, on genetics. Uh, a project I did uh, last month that is called Beforest showed that uh, we, we can uh, now have materials that grow faster, but also that is more resilient, resistant to drought, resistant to insects. Um, we have also uh, a good knowledge of adequation of the genetic resources and the sites, so we can make precision silviculture. We can say at the top of the hill we can select this material, at the bottom of the hill we can put that one, in dry area we can put this one. Um, we have also an improved knowledge on management. We have many models and planted forests are very convenient to do models because they are quite simple to modelize, so we can estimate the growth of in the future, we can estimate the effect of climate, uh, we can estimate the effect of pathogens, so we have many models that are of interest. Um, so all these things are available because planted forests are uh, attractive and simple to model, and so there is a lot of science ongoing there. Uh, what are the recent developments of interest? Perhaps the first uh, result of interest is coming from social science. Uh, we see that um, all the survey made uh, with uh, stakeholders, with forest managers, forest owners, show that there is an increasing demand of resilience and not only uh, an a demand of increasing the yield and the productivity of planted forest. Uh, all the stakeholders are very concerned by uh, a global change, emerging pest and disease, drought, fires. Um, the economic science also is working on the, the new uh, typology of planted forest, and we see an emerging demand of planted forest for carbon sequestration, for biodiversity restoration, and so this is many new business models that have to be addressed. Uh, in planted forests, as we select what we will plant, the genetic component is a key. And uh, there is still a lot to do to explore the intraspecific viability. Um, when we face a problem, usually we think to change our species. But within a species, within the distribution range of species, there is many things to explore, and there is a need to explore that more, uh, especially to face the climate change adversity. Uh, so there is a need for more international cooperation on genetics. Um, and there is a need for more trials, because uh, even if we have tools to uh, quickly uh, assess DNA of trees, um, we, we need to, to stretch the trees outside the distribution area to see how they will react in the future. I am coordinating a project called Rainforce, where we are doing that, but there is many other projects that should be started to to support this international science. Ayufro has been also very active in supporting that uh, 30 years ago on Douglas Fir, for example. Um, and then also there is a, the need uh, to work on the interaction with pathogens and the genetics. So there are more and more works looking how sensitive are the tree to emerging pests and disease. What are the exotic pests and disease that can come? There is sentinel plantations that are settled by the scientists and there is a need of international cooperation to, to tackle this risk of introduction of new disease and pests. So how can we facilitate uptakes and, facility and uh, access to knowledge to, to everybody? Um, this is kind of daily activity for my association, and we try to set up plantedforest.org, a resource center where all the stakeholders will find key information. Um, I think we have to improve cooperation and leave political barriers to exchange genetic materials because with the global change, we, we need to be able to, to use, to make the most of all the genetic resources all over the world. Um, there is an uncertainty on global change and uh, we need FAO to, to give us visibility of what will be the climate in 50 years. And also FAO has done a huge work uh, about treatment of wood in the past and we will need FAO also to, to have a look at the uh, container traffic that uh, import a lot of disease and pests and that threatens the forest and especially the forest we use for 
uh, wood production. And then also, uh, this is my last point, uh, we will organize next year, uh, probably in Africa, and uh, hopefully, if we're able to do it uh, with Kenya colleagues in Kenya, the International Congress on Planted Forest in 2023, in October or early November. And you are more well than welcome to, to attend this event, to, uh, to share knowledge with us. So the call for papers and uh, uh, save the date will come soon. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christophe. And let me join the panelists. So we have an empty chair here. <laughs> Thank you very much, Christophe, for telling us more about how research is supporting uh, planting of forests and trees and uh, how to, the dissemination of this work is taking place. I would now like to invite Mr. Martin Vey, and I would like him to speak a little bit more about how fast-growing trees contribute significantly to the provision of wood, but not only wood, other ecosystem services. Can you tell more about the new mandate of the International Commission on Poplars and Other Fast-Growing Trees Sustaining People and the Environment, the IPC, and how can it support the sustainable production of wood and the non-wood planted forest? Thank you, Thais, for this kind introduction. Let me start with saying what the IPC is um, in a very short form. The IPC is a proven model for technical, uh, international technical cooperation in forestry. It is a science policy implementation um, platform converting science-based solutions into practice. That is what we are going for. And as you already can see in the name, um, our focus is on fast-growing trees. Let me say a few words about what are these fast-growing trees. There are numbers in the literature telling that um, it's forests growing with roughly more than 10 cubic meter uh, annual increment uh, per year. But those of you who are in forestry are fully aware of uh, that those numbers will be achieved by any even conventional forest species. But, and that's an important but, you would have to wait several decades until you achieve these high um, annual increments. And this is the main difference of these so-called fast growing trees. That those um, are often in an ecological sense, early successional species that achieve these high um, annual increments already after five or 10 years. And as you easily can imagine, that means um, that you can achieve very high land use efficiencies by using those fast growing trees. If you imagine you replace um, or you harvest those trees after 10 or 20 years, depending on in what climate you are and um, rotating the system all the time. And this is also uh, reflected by this kind of interesting figures that we have already heard this morning, um, that only 3% of the forest area are covered by these um, intensely managed planted forests, but on the other hand, one third of the roundwood production in the world is coming from these plantations, which is quite interesting. And these fast growing trees, um, they can be grown either in traditional silvicultural systems uh, or also in short, so-called short rotation forestry, or we can also use them in agroforestry systems. And um, we have within the IPC, we are working in several working parties, um, focusing, for example, on genetic resources or production systems or ecological or ecosystem services and so on. And we are working, I have a lot of experience on especially um, poplars and willows because that was where the um, species that we have been working with uh, traditionally. So we have been looking into uh, production capacities, management systems. Recently, we have been looking into carbon accumulation, both above ground and below ground and the different carbon fractions I am one PhD student working with. And we, have also, we are also looking into different value chains 
of these uh, um, forests or these trees and um, using them not only as a, for energy production in traditional heat power plants, uh, but also for ethanol production, biogas production. And I have, um, if I'm one member of my research group, Anneli Adler, who is also the chair of the Swedish National Poplar Commission, she is, has now in a pilot project um, been working on uh, using poplars for textile. So there are lots of different possibilities how these fast growing trees uh, can be used. And this is the basis where we within the IPC uh, are coming from. And in addition, because of this very fast um, growth rate, all the ecological processes are kind of accelerated. So these systems are really fantastic model systems to test also ecological theory, for example, on biodiversity ecosystem functioning. So we use our willow plantations to test uh, those hypotheses in a big global framework of tree diversity experiments where we can, in our fast growing trees, test these hypotheses much faster than the colleagues working with other kinds of tree species. And now to the broader mandate um, of the uh, IPC that uh, includes or implies now that we can include more uh, species, but not only more species, but also uh, different geographies. And we are, for example, interested to work much more with colleagues in Africa and also Asia. And just to, to give you an example, this jacket is made of bamboo. And uh, this is one of those species that we could now include um, also in our further work, although one can, of course, uh, discuss whether this is a tree or a grass. But still, this is this kind of... Um, we have own experience already in the IPC. I have been working with bamboo in Africa, so it's not only in Asia, but also in Africa. And so we have probably a lot of sleeping uh, competence even within the IPC to work together with colleagues in all parts of the world to really make this broadened mandate of the IPC um, making a living thing. And the second uh, thing, we believe that we will this broadened mandate that really can also align our work much more with the overall FIO goals of yeah, the 2030 agenda, the UN decade uh, on family farming or the UN decade on ecosystem restoration. And finally, I would therefore like to invite um, those countries who so far have not been too much interested in our work because we naturally, I mean, we have been, re we had reduced our work to poplars and willows. But now after this broadened mandate, we can already see that we have received much more interest from colleagues, for example, from uh, Madagascar and from Uganda who have joined our business meetings and we hope that um, this will in the end lead to that we get more members um, and that more people are interested in joining us and the IPC Secretariat will um, certainly help you to understand and uh, perform the membership procedures and how they work. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Martin. Thank you very much for explaining the context that we are in terms of science and what IPC is doing uh, to advance planted forests, to advance fast growing species. And I reinforce Martin's invitation for those who are not yet part of the IPC, but want to know more about this work and want to engage with the commission, please uh, call us you know, uh, we can have also more information. Our colleague Faustine Zoveda also can support you because uh, the work of IPC is critical uh, for us to advance on the Agenda 2030, in particular on the contributions from planted forests, from fast-growing planted forests. So, with that, I would like to move to policy. Now, we spoke about science, so now let's speak a little bit more about uh, policy and what countries are doing. 
I would like to welcome Mr. Tom Okello Obong. Um, Tom, Uganda has now a significant expansion in the area of planted forests in the past 15 and 20 years. It's small and is small and medium tree growers own most of these planted forests with a direct impact in terms of job creation with more than 12,000 jobs created so far. So what were the success factors for this change? question which has just been put to me and uh, I will start by saying that um, in Uganda the area under planted forest increased by over 100 percent from 2004 to date where it increased from around 54,000 hectares to over 110,000 hectares and these are areas which are planted in government owned forest reserves but planted by the private sector, by the small and medium uh, players that the moderator have talked about. To date, we estimate that the available round wood has also increased from around 200,000 cubic meters in 2019 and will reach about 800,000 cubic meters by next year. The country is therefore shifting to a condition of an oversupply of the wood product in the market. And this will call for increased investment in milling, value addition, and market development. We need support and partnerships to carry out assessment of the other many small to medium plantations which have been established on private land. I think in the presentation which we have seen, on uh, other planted forest, most of it is unknown and even this is true in my country where we have considerable amount of forest planted by individuals in their households, in their farm halls and we have not done assessment of these plantations. What did we do differently? The government from our, around 2004 introduced a private sector commercial tree planting program, which allowed individuals, companies, groups to plant trees in government forest reserves on long term lease or what we call licensing of up to 50 years. And at that time, 200,000 hectares of forest land was earmarked. This was mainly the grasslands and then the bushlands were earmarked for plantation establishment. The objective for providing this land was to provide alternative sources of forest products to release pressure on the natural forest and also to provide raw materials for wood value chain development and also improve the livelihoods and income of the tree farmers and the local communities but also to contribute to economic development. This program is in line with the government national forest policy, which aims at having an integrated forest sector, which achieves sustainable increase in the economic, social and environmental benefits from forests and trees by all the people of Uganda, especially the poor and the vulnerable. It is also in line with the national development aspirations of increasing forest cover and also the vision 2040, which aims to restore forest cover up to around 24%, the level we had in 1990. Um, the government, with funding from the government of Norway initially, but later on with the substantial funding from the European Union, implemented what we call the solo production grant scheme. And uh, is, and this scheme started in 2004 in three phases, 2004 to 9, 2009 to 13, and then 16 to 21, which ended just last year. And this scheme was the biggest catalyst for the private sector 
to plant trees in forest reserve and to establish plantations. Due to the long-term repayment period for forest investment, many private investors did not want to venture into commercial forestry. It is also important to note that phase three of this solar production grant scheme was implemented by the Food and Agriculture Organization with the overall aim to increase rural income through commercial tree planting by private sector actors and also local communities in Uganda. It also at the same time helped to mitigate climate change effects through intensive afforestation. The three phases attracted substantial investment and contributed up to around 70,000 hectares of plantation forest. And also, additionally, it also targeted small communities and then institutions where a total of about 7,500 hectares was also planted. This grant scheme also helped build capacity for seed collection, nursery establishments, and production of seedlings, and also for planting and caring for the planted trees. So, the other thing which government did around 2016 was to design a project which was called the Farm Income Enhancement and Forest Conservation Project. This was mainly geared towards uh, improving the household incomes and also food security, but also ensuring that the communities become resilient and also improve on their natural management, natural resource management capability, especially on management of fragile ecosystems and the watershed. This project has also contributed over 9.2 million seedlings, which was planted, distributed to the communities and planted. And uh, the government also implemented the community tree planting program, where over 100 million seedlings were raised and distributed to the farmers in five years. And these were given free and mainly this was targeting indigenous species to try to protect what we were losing from the natural forest. And as a follow-up to the, community nas the National Community Tree Planting Program, we are now implementing a mass tree planting program, which is, which is called named Running Out of Trees campaign, which is Roots. And uh, we intend to be planting 40 million trees every year for the next five years. This one started last year also. And you are welcome to join us and support this program. The right of ownership of the planted trees, I think, also contributed to people planting trees because in the law, in the policy, trees belong to the people. So if you have trees on your farmland, it is your property. And um, it is an incentive for people to own even natural forests. There are people who own small natural forests. Yeah, so to conclude, I'm saying that the improved quality of planting materials improve varieties and conditions which favors tree planting really contributed to the increase in the commercial plantations. And these plantations offer opportunities for investments into wood-based industries, including pepper and pulp and panel products. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Tom. I know there is so much to tell about the Uganda case, but thank you very much for showing us how policy could actually drive uh, these, these uh, uh, advancing in, in planting for forests, uh, but also how Uganda uh, adopted a value chain approach to this planting um, of forests and trees and engaged with communities. So I would like to turn now to uh, Mr. Julian Noel Hakotuarisoa. I hope I am pronouncing it more or less correctly. And uh, um, Mr. Julian Noel is going to speak in French, I was told. Um, and I also was told that there is a bit of an issue with the translation. You cannot get the translation to everyone. So everyone is actually going to receive your message in English. So, um, we know that planted forests are established for a variety of management objectives. Well-managed forests can also deliver a suite of ecosystem services, 
such as enhancing water quality, protecting soils, or providing buffers against floods and extreme weather events. Countries identify, also identify planted forests as an option to restore degraded landscapes. We are going now to hear from Mr. Julien Noel from Madagascar. What is the foreseen role of planted forests to meet the pledge of 4 million hectares to be restored by 2030? Merci, Thaïs, de, de m'avoir donné la parole. Et bonjour aux panélistes, bonjour à tout le monde. En fait, euh, j'aime bien parler Thank en français. You. Thank you for giving me the floor. En fait, je voudrais utiliser la langue française pour like mettre French beaucoup plus de diversité aussi sur la langue. To add to the Ça donne beaucoup plus de résilience pour les échanges. And I think that that is important to improve the our exchanges. La demande en bois d'énergie est omniprésent à Madagascar et ceci avec un rythme. Could the translate uh, the interpreters just wait for him to make a pause and then come with the English? Just a quick uh, pause. Yes. Great. Euh, comme je disais, donc, la demande en bois énergie est omniprésente et reste toujours euh, croissant à Madagascar, comme d'autres pays en Afrique, et ceci suit le rythme de la démographie. La demande pour la wood energy est uh, très forte à Madagascar et elle est along avec la population growth in Madagascar. Actuellement, euh, ça s'élève à peu près à 18 millions de mètres cubes par an en termes de besoins au niveau national. The current needs are about 18 million cubic meters per year at the national level. Mais seulement, on pourrait en avoir déjà fait un inventaire comme quoi moins de 4% seulement de cet approvisionnement vient des plantations de forêts. And according to estimates, only 4% of the wood supply comes from planted forests. Encore un contexte comme quoi 10 millions de mètres cubes de bois d'énergie par an provient des sources non connues, c'est-à-dire en surexploitation des forêts de plantation ou bien directement prélevées dans les forêts naturelles. So 10 million uh, cubic meters are coming from forests, uh, naturally, natural forests throughout the country. Cependant, comme vous l'avez évoqué, Thaïs, c'est que les plantations forestières à Madagascar, celles qui sont déjà existantes et les autres à venir, produisent pas mal de produits, euh, services écosystémiques. Planted forests, those that exist and those that will be planted, are providing very important ecosystem services in Madagascar. Les forêts plantées constituent une option de restauration des paysages dégradés. Planted forests are very important to restore degraded uh, ecosystems. Les forêts plantées forment aussi des zones tampons qui protègent donc, la biodiversité au niveau des forêts naturelles en ayant Planted des forêts de dégradation. Provide a buffer that protects the natural forest. Et enfin, les forêts plantées sont euh, urgentement nécessaires pour pouvoir donc remplir les besoins en matière de bois d'énergie, bois de construction et bois de service. Therefore, planted forests are necessary to meet the needs in terms of wood fuel and uh, construction wood and wood for other purposes. Euh, pour revenir donc aux forêts plantées comme option de restauration des paysages dégradés. So coming back to planted forests and their role in restoring degraded ecosystems. Madagascar s'est engagé à restaurer 4 millions d'hectares de terres dégradées de forêts d'ici 2030. Madagascar has indeed committed to restoring 4 million hectares by 2030. Cela ne veut pas dire que Madagascar va mettre en place 4 millions d'hectares de reboisement. This does not mean that Madagascar will be planting 4 million hectares. Mais 4 millions d'hectares de paysages retrouveront donc leur fonctionnalité. But 4 million hectares will be returned to their uh, natural function. Donc l'engagement de restauration se focalise sur le maintien et l'amélioration des services écosystémiques. And the focus of the restoration is to improve, the, to maintain and improve the ecosystem services. Le bon équilibre entre ces services est atteint en mettant en place un arrangement rationnel des usages des terres 
un mosaïque d'utilisation bien équilibré. And this can be achieved through a mosaic approach to uh, planting. En partant des divers paramètres biophysiques et socio-économiques. Starting from different biophysical and socio-economic parameters. Ce que je veux mettre en exergue, c'est que les plantations forestières constituent un élément clé parmi les mosaïques d'occupation à mettre en place dans la restauration de nos paysages en Madagascar. And these mosaic plantations are key in the approach to ecosystem restoration. En assurant donc diverses fonctions vitales pour une gestion durable des écosystèmes. And they have a vital role to play in the sustainable management of ecosystems. Les groupes de fonctions ciblées sont relativement à la gestion du sol, de l'eau et de la biomasse. And the groups of functions that are being aimed at are uh, protection of the soil, uh, water and biomass. Ainsi, pour mettre en place notre engagement, on a essayé d'établir un guide pour les essences forestières utilisables donc pour la restauration. And we have uh, put together a guide for the different species to be used for the reforestation. Ainsi, dans ce guide, on pourra choisir les espèces adaptées pour la restauration des sols, pour la gestion de l'eau et aussi pour la production de biomasse et selon les types d'écorégions. And this will make it possible to choose the right varieties for the different uses for soil, for uh, fuel and uh, the other purposes, choosing the right varieties for the different regions of the country. Donc, une grande partie des impacts entendus de notre engagement en matière de restauration dépend de la promotion de plantations d'arbres dans nos paysages. And therefore, much of our strategy depends on planting uh, forests in the country. Il faut aussi euh, mentionner que l'interdépendance des éléments au sein des mosaïques d'occupation des paysages nous montre que les plantations à vocation de protection et d'amélioration du sol créent des conditions favorables pour la production dans les terrains agricoles. It should also be noted that the, uh, this approach to planting the different varieties of trees in the areas creates favorable conditions also for agricultural development. Deuxièmement, la chose la plus importante, c'est le rôle de ces plantations pour pouvoir donc conserver la biodiversité de Madagascar et atténuer le changement climatique. And the second very important aspect of this strategy is the role that for planted forests can play in protecting biodiversity and dealing with the impacts of climate change. La, les plantations de forêts constituent une dernière chance pour la sauvegarde de la biodiversité unique de Madagascar, donc pour le planète aussi. And planted forests are an essential strategy for the protection of the biodiversity of Madagascar and uh, for the biodiversity of the world. Les besoins en ressources ligneuses et aussi les recherches de terrains cultivables ont entraîné des pertes considérables en matière de biodiversité. So far, the need for wood and also the need for an increase in agricultural land has led to a loss of biodiversity. Mettre en place des plantations au niveau des paysages, c'est de créer des zones tampons pour amortir les pressions de prélèvement au niveau des forêts naturelles, donc protéger la biodiversité. And planted forests can mean creating buffer zones that can reduce the pressure on the uh, natural forests and protecting biodiversity in this way. Et la production de biomasse au niveau des plantations, c'est du stockage de carbone, donc c'est aussi donc de l'atténuation face aux impacts du changement climatique. And the biomass also has an important role to play in terms of carbon sequestration, and therefore reducing this way the impact of climate change. Enfin, euh, je ne peux pas évoquer le sujet des forêts plantées sans toucher aux besoins d'approvisionnement en bois d'énergie et bois d'œuvre. And speaking of planted forests, of course, one also must consider the needs in terms of uh, wood fuel and wood for construction purposes. Étant donné le besoin en bois d'énergie euh, très, très croissant, comme je disais euh, à l'introduction. The need for wood energy is growing substantially, as I said at the very beginning. La préparation des productions futures pour la promotion des reboisements à grande échelle figure par les axes principaux défini lors des assises qu'on a organisées à Madagascar. And therefore, reforestation is one of the major strategies that was decided on during the important conference held in Madagascar. 
Donc, ce sera des reboisements à grande échelle de l'État, des reboisements avec les investisseurs privés. And so we're speaking of large-scale reforestation in government land and also through private investment. Et aussi l'insertion des euh, alternatives en bois à cycle court comme le bambou. And there will also be other alternative sources of wood, including short cycle wood and bamboo. En conclusion, je souligne, comme vous l'aurez compris, que les forêts plantées sont indispensables à l'atteinte des multiples objectifs du gouvernement de Madagascar. And in conclusion, you have certainly understood that planted forests are necessary to achieve the many objectives of the government of Madagascar. Un dernier élément à titre de sensibilisation, c'est que l'Afrique, le grand continent, est réputé pour les big five, pour les animaux, pour la faune. And uh, a final word, Africa is often known for the big five, the major uh, five uh, fauna species. Et Madagascar, c'est beaucoup plus les small five. In Madagascar, we'd speak more of the small five. Et il est très triste qu'actuellement, il est déclaré que le plus petit primate de la planète qui se trouve à Madagascar, le microcébus bertaillé, avec un poids d'environ 30 grammes qu'on peut tenir dans la main, a little, little creature, only 30 grams that you can hold in the palm of your hand, a été déclaré éteint par un de nos primatologues qui est reconnu dans le monde entier. Has now been declared as uh, being extinct by one of the greatest uh, ethologists of the world. C'est encore l'impact de cette manque de plantation pour subvenir aux besoins et qui impacte les forêts naturelles. Je And vous this, remercie. This is also due to the lack of reforestation uh, to produce the wood that is necessary for the needs of our country. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Julien Noël. Merci. Uh, it's a very interesting uh, experience, a very interesting approach. Um, I think that you had a lot of elements here on how to implement, but also, but also how, um, how we can choose species according to the different objectives and uh, uh, restore uh, the sustainable, uh, the, the landscapes for their sustainability. So without further delay, I would like to turn to Ross Hampton. Um, Ross, yesterday we had the launch here of the Global Forest Industries Outlook 2050, and it revealed that the consumption of primary processed wood products could increase by 37% by 2050, compared to an increase of only 28% over the past 30 years. If, despite a lower population of growth in the, in the same period. So what are the challenges and the opportunities that the industry will face to meet this future demand? What is the role of planted forests in this uh, effort? Ross, please. Well, thank you very much, and, uh, Thank you to our panelists, it's been fascinating. And congratulations to all of you online and in the audience. Um, it's really great to be here. I'll tell you why. I said congratulations for just a moment. The role I have here today really is the interface uh, between FAO and the private sector. One of the statutory bodies for FAO is the Advisory Committee on Sustainable Forest Based Industries, and I'm the chair of that committee. We uh, have a, a mandate to advise the Director General on the sorts of things. Thank you. Okay, I'm not sure how much uh, you heard of that, so I'll start again. Uh, I'm the current chair of the advisory committee on sustainable forest-based industry, so our mandate is to advise the DG of the best way to interface with the private sector. Um, and what I said at the very beginning is, is congratulations uh, to those of you in the audience online and indeed in the auditorium because although there's many wonderful events this week, uh, World Forest Week, this is the main event. This is the crucial event for us all. Uh, you only have to observe what's happened in Pakistan, uh, observe um, the heat waves in Europe. Um, we've got floods in Australia now wiping out communities, and you'll recall we, were, we had terrible fires two or three years ago. 
This is the overriding question of our age, is how to deal with runaway climate change. And so it's not an option to deal with planting more forests. This is what you heard from Tears and the uh, team at FAO yesterday, and indeed most of you, I'm sure, will have read many of the reports from Potsdam, WWF and others that talk about the need to pivot rapidly to much, much more fibre in our global consumption diet. I mean, um, we've only want to, I only want to make three quick points, Tyres, and this is the first. Henry's didn't know it, but he's going to be the model for my first point. Uh, Martin, sorry, because Martin's jacket is what we all have to be wearing. It's uh, the fashion industry is a 1.2 billion a year trade. 10 per cent of global emissions are coming out of fashion. Thank you, Martin, for making a little inroads into fibre-based clothing. I said yesterday, and you will have heard this, some of you already, that in, in construction, as Potsdam uh, keeps telling us, construction has to change rapidly to timber. We've got, in the next 20 to 30 years, as much building is going to take place in the world as has taken place till now, up to now, from the beginning of time to now. And you try to think about that. If, you, if we don't turn that into a carbon sink, uh, then we can forget about it. And, and we're not even going to have time to talk about sustainable aviation fuels or the pivot to plastics. Um, all of our fantastic global uh, fibre and packaging companies are rapidly trying to move into the plastics market to replace oil-based petroleum-based packaging. But even so, that's considered to keep growing, to be the fifth largest emitting country. They call it the plastic kingdom, the, large, the fifth largest emitting country uh, by volume, 15 per cent of emissions. So I don't want to spend too long making the case, because I think you all know it, that we have to move fast into this area of getting fibre into the world diet. Well, that brings us to trees. And there's no way, this is my second point, there's no way for us to get to that volume as report after report tells us, unless we embrace planted forests. And I don't mean accept, I mean embrace, I mean fast track, I mean move rapidly into planting far, far more, far more many trees. Uh, the FAA report, if I've read it correctly overnight, uh, tells, suggests um, 37 million hectares just to keep pace with business as usual. Uh, if we were to pivot dramatically into a, a global fibre-based commodity diet, this number would have to increase. So it's not an option, and I, I'd hate us in this room to think that it's somehow we can have either, either planting forests or environmental plantings and, and land remediation plantings. We're going to need to do both. But often I find in, in my work internationally that the planted forests are coming third in those conversations. Now my third and last point, moderator, is that doesn't have to mean the same thing everywhere in the world. In fact, it very much won't mean the same thing everywhere in the world. It's going to look very different in Uganda. It's going to look different in Australia. It's going to look different in Scotland, where I've just come from, where they're doing a mixed, a mixed sort of pattern of species, Sitka spruce um, in one area for the sawmills, but then broadleaves in another area to add, add biodiversity and amenity. It's all about climate mitigation, though. They're storing carbon, all of those trees, whether they're for the sawmill and the harvested wood products or whether they're for the slower growing trees. It's going to look different in Finland. Got colleagues from Finland and fantastic video coming up. Uh, it's going to look different in, in Canada and uh, in Sweden and Brazil and New Zealand. But it has to go forward rapidly. And that's uh, where the private sector comes in. So the private sector is ready to create new generation uh, investment platforms. And we're seeing this around the world already. So the platform of investment that might have uh, produced the plantation or the planted forest that we see in Australia, which is, which is monoculture, it's alongside our biodiverse native forests. So we want to keep the land use as, as tight as possible. So we want to do small plantings of, of monoculture and we want to offset farming. So we want our beef farmers to be carbon neutral by planting more trees like a crop. Uh, that model probably isn't going to translate so well to Uganda or Mozambique or, or indeed to other parts of the world. I'm talking to Gabon quite a lot and I know they're doing a different model of growing sustainable forestry. So uh, we'll work with uh, WWF, we'll work with uh, fast growing trees, we'll work with FAO. Private sector is ready to work with governments, with anyone, to develop the right sort of investment vehicles uh, that will suit the country and that will suit the, the different uh, values and variables of that country, as we've just heard from Mozambique, 
but we, are, we need to do it. Let's just, uh, if I can end there, moderator, please. Let's be in no, leave this room completely sure that not only do we have to do it, we have to do it fast. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ross, for this compelling message. <laughs> And indeed, we need to move fast. Uh, we, are, we have a climate urgency. We need to change the way we, we consume. We need to change you know, the, 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 the percentage of fossil fuel in our lives. And wood and forests have a very important role to play. So we really need to move very fast. And with that, I turn to Mr. Luis Neves. Um, Beyond production and environmental considerations, social costs and benefits are an essential dimension in planted forests. Can well-managed, inclusive and profitable plantations become a reality at scale? What are the tools and approaches enabling communities to take part in the decision-making process? Please. Thank you very much, Thais, and uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, well, in short, uh, the answer is yes, it's possible. Um, on the, the initiative that I've been uh, leading for the last 15 years, uh, called New Generation Plantations, we have been working with private sector, uh, with local communities and uh, local um, government agencies in many different geographies of the world. Uh, what we did uh, was uh, to go through those landscapes to convene these multiple uh, different types of stakeholders with different cultural backgrounds, um, orientation for productivity and profit from private sector, uh, hearing from the different values of the indigenous and local communities, and uh, convene around the challenges that we are uh, discussing here. Uh, how, the, how can uh, those local economies be developed in a way that they are really inclusive for all those different parties, uh, where are the blockages and how to overcome uh, those challenges. Um, this is never uh, a, a task that is achieved in any moment. Uh, it is a continuous uh, uh, work in progress because uh, indeed that's also how nature uh, works, uh, that's how landscapes they evolve and that's also how our societies they evolve. We are continuously resolving uh, one issue and moving to the next one. So the fundamental uh, conclusion that we have taken from this uh, already long road in terms of interacting with me many different landscapes where the intensively managed plantations are being developed is that it is fundamental to develop a landscape approach which convenes all these different parties from the landscape that uh, we are able to create effective participatory processes uh, which empower the local communities, enable them to be part of the discussions and the decision-making processes. Uh, and this needs to be done uh, in a continuous way. This needs to be done in long term and with stable uh, source uh, of uh, finance that all the parties, they know exactly <laughs> that this process it's an honest process and will continue on that, on that long run. And this links very much also what we heard from, uh, from Ross in terms of currently there is a huge effort to develop innovative financing mechanisms that address the multiple needs for us to move fast on this path of investment. Uh, we need obviously to be able to make uh, the large-scale commercial funding that will enable the private sector to invest on achieving the numbers which are extremely challenging uh, everywhere, but at the same time uh, we need that those financing vehicles, they also bring the other kind of finance that currently is not available, doesn't exist, to address the environmental and the social aspects on those landscapes. This is not commercial funding, it's funding that needs to come from the revenues that we all take in terms of 
restoring carbon in the landscapes, having uh, wealthy ecosystems which don't allow us to hear stories like uh, the, the species from those uh, regions, they keep to disappear, and also uh, to bring into the value chain those uh, local groups that until now the economy hasn't been able to include them. And this is an investment that needs to be taken inside the economy. It can't be continue to be an externali externality. It needs to transform in an internality. It needs to be a value that is recognized and we need to do this on a permanent basis. And those are the innovative uh, finance vehicles which are being tested, are being developed. And uh, here I leave my words to, uh, to those who are making this effort by taking the risks. It's the moment to take the risks because the, the risks of not taking the action, they are much uh, greater at this stage. So with this, I think I've answered to the main question. Thank you very much once more. Thank you very much, Luis. Uh, this is a very important experience, the one with the new generation plantations and all the work also to have the social aspects taken into consideration when expanding uh, industrial production. So we are very close to our uh, end time. We're behind the schedule, but I think we have the opportunity to have at least one question. So anyone wants to ask our panelists? I think everyone is already thinking of the next COFO session. Well, sorry. Yes, please. Can you please identify yourself? Hello. Hello, hello. Um, yeah, my name is Agustin. I'm the recently elected IFSA president of the International Forestry Student Association. I'm from Chile and we have a big industry on um, rapid growing plantations. But we have a big also resistance from the, not only the local community that live uh, near the, the plantations, but from the society that lives in the cities, for example, from ecological perspective, from biodiversity. How do you um, think that we can overcome this and we can actually keep planting if the, uh, most of the people that are linked to forests, that aren't foresters, don't want us to keep planting more trees? Thank you. Are you directing the question to someone specific? No, anyone that would like to answer. Luis, maybe? Yeah. Russ? Ah, yeah. oh, Christoph. Yes, <coughs> I don't know if you can hear me. Uh, yes, I, I think that science can contribute um, because there is a many level, many level and a, a wide diversity of pl plantations. And um, there is some statement done um, by some uh, NGOs that are wrong. For example, biodiversity is not compatible with plantation. It's not true. For example, clear cuts are demonstrated now, and there is a meta-analysis coming out in a few weeks that demonstrates that uh, we have as much biodiversity after clear cut or not after clear cut. There is things to estimate. There is impact on soil, for example, and uh, nutrient export that have to be studied uh, on site because this is varying a lot from one side to the other. We have seen the example also for biodiversity conservation and restoration. We have many cases of plantation related to that. And we have to explain that the reality of, uh, of uh, plantation, uh, evidence-based from science, is much more complex and that the plantation can bring much more amenities than people think. Of course, it produces wood, but it serves also society for many other aspects. So science can help. Thank you very much, Christoph. I think Martin would like to complement the answer. Yeah, I can um, just add in more also that I am a plant ecologist myself, so I, I think um, I understand very well what you are saying. And I just would like to add that we must have really high ambitions of what we are doing is also um, ecologically sound. So that's why we need um, ecological studies that look into 
the effects on carbon accumulation and um, species diversity and to create plantations that are, for example, yeah, what we are seeing if we mix different species or so, can we at least maintain, for example, the, uh, the biomass um, uh, yields and is this something that industry also can live with because they want to have homogeneous products. So we have always to see the whole value chain. So it is a challenge, but we need to have very high ambitions, uh, not only from the um, yeah, end user perspective, but also from the um, ecological perspective. And when we are with this high um, scientific ambitions um, talking to the people, I think we should be able to convince them that this is something that is good for everybody. Thank you, Martin. Uh, Luis? I think, this, I think this is where the discussion starts to be interesting because we have heard these arguments and I know the conflict is talking about and they don't hear these arguments, right? It's a very political conflict about the Mapuche people uh, reclaiming access to their ancestral lands. So this is exactly where inclusiveness comes and the social dimension that overcomes on the technical on the scientific aspects. And that's really the complexity. It's almost impossible to replicate solutions from one place to the other because this is a very specific conflict between the Mapuche people with, uh, let's say, the, the, the Chilean state. And because plantations, it's the large land use in that region, it's caught in the middle of the, of the conflict. So I would say that the conflict is less about the specificities of plantations but very much related with access to land and the land rights. Thank you, Louise, and thank you very much for your question. I think this was a very good complement to the discussions we had here today. Uh, just as a matter of curiosity, when we were planning this side event, we thought of this, the title Demystifying Planted Forests, and I think this addresses also the lack of awareness and the lack of uh, understanding sometimes with a lot of prejudice against uh, planted forests, and we need to help to disseminate more what they really are, what are the possibilities, uh, and that uh, there are very good practice to be disseminated. I see Cecile. Cecile, I just ask you to be very quick because we're sh very <laughs> short on time now. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I'm Cecile, I'm, uh, call, I'm based in Cameroon, and I'm working with uh, 20 countries, women in 20 countries in Africa. And uh, we, we have come to an agreement that we need forest plantations. But the problem with women in Africa is that they don't own anything. They don't have land to plant even those forests. So how can you secure the tenure for the women to get involved in the forest plantation? And I did not hear much about how they could link a plantation, forest plantation, and livelihood development for those communities. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cecile. Who would like to take this one? I, I, can, I can say something. Tom? Yeah, thank you so much, Cici. And uh, thank you so much for your concern as an African lady. True, in the many African societies, women don't own land. And uh, I think one of the ways we are going through that is under the, 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 the program in Uganda, where we are leasing, we are, we are licensing land for tree planting. We also have uh, at least reserve 5% for what we call under collaborative forest management, where we, we give the communities and for them, they don't pay for the land fees. The other private sector developers pay for ground rent on an annual basis, but these communities don't pay for, for ground rent. And uh, when we are giving seedlings, I did not give you the statistics. You find we also have uh, earmarked seedlings, which are for women group and even for the youth group. So under that collaborative forest management, we really encourage women groups to also plant their own trees in the government forest reserve. 
under that collaborative forest management. And they own the trees and they can benefit from it. But uh, I really entirely agree with you that without the affirmative action, then the women will be left out, which is not good. Thank you. Yes, very quick. Yes, very quick. Hmm? So good to see you, Cecile. Uh, and uh, regarding the second part of, of the question, I think uh, it's through the, the landscape integration of the plantations uh, where we need to hear from those local groups, the communities, what they need in terms of livelihoods. And it is perfectly possible to integrate the development of the plantation with the restoration of natural forest and establishment of agroforestry systems. So depending then in terms of the structure of the landscape, uh, a good and well-designed project should incorporate these three dimensions of the project. Thank you, Luis, and thank you to all panelists. Well, if the moderator can say something, Cecile, in the publication we launched yesterday, the uh, Forest Industry uh, Outlook 2050, uh, there is a very specific recommendation on addressing the ownership structure. This is fundamental for us to meet the needs of expanding planted forests and expanding uh, the wood production and the bi biomass production, but also achieving the restoration needs. So it's a very important question. And with that, I think that uh, closing remarks are, are uh, almost uh, uh, unnecessary in the sense that you have clearly seen the role of science, uh, the role of policy, um, the role of being working with the private sector and how actually the objectives converge. So we have seen here many different speakers from different uh, regions of the world from different uh, uh, professional backgrounds, different experience, and we all, I think, uh, 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 agree that not only is needed to, we need to expand planted forests. Planted forests are critical for sustainable landscapes, for meeting the uh, objectives of the one decade of ecosystem restoration, to meet the objectives of uh, uh, socioeconomic, eradicating rural poverty, and to allow us to transition to a carbon neutral economy. And science is here, and they have different options, modalities on the ways we can expand these planted forests. They are working a lot on the dissemination. We heard here about the networks. We heard here about the work that the IPC is doing. We also have very good examples on how countries are actually taking the lead and implementing policies that can support these efforts, that can really uh, support uh, 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 this uh, uh, restoration and socioeconomic uh, uh, benefits from planted forests. And we have also heard how the private sector is actually ready to tackle the challenge, including uh, addressing uh, the social issues. So thank you very much to all the panelists for this very rich discussion. Thank you to the participants. Thank you for the questions. And I wish you a very good rest of the day. Thank you very much.